So, Matthew 10, we're going to be down at verse 26. Matthew 10, verse 26. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, again, I thank you for this day. And Lord, truly when I think about it, I can never run out of things to be thankful for. And I thank you for that even. When we count our blessings and really see them all, Lord, you've been so very good to us. And Lord, you've given us and blessed us more than we could ever deserve. And even if you never blessed me again after today, I still have been blessed immensely throughout my life. And Lord, I thank you for the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that, that despite all that may go on around me, all that may go on around each of us, Lord, that hope can never be taken away. And Lord, I thank you that we can trust in his death, burial, and resurrection for our salvation, knowing that he died for my sins. And Lord, how humbling that is that he died for me. And I pray that each of us this day would be that living sacrifice that you want that you want our obedience above all else, and I pray that we would do that. And I pray that this message would bless you, that you would be exalted and magnified, and I pray that your Holy Spirit, that he would help us with the understanding, and then how to apply it and use it in our day-to-day -day life. And God, I thank you. And these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so Matthew chapter 10, drop down to verse 26. And of course, it's Jesus Christ speaking. And he says, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And it's interesting, you know, because I didn't plan all of this, but... It ties right into what we talked about this morning at 10 o'clock with Hebrews chapter 10 and everything there. And, and people today believe that we, as disciples of Jesus Christ, are in a time like no other. That the world is becoming more and more antagonistic towards Christianity, and believers are being marginalized, pushed aside, and persecuted. However, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus Christ is discussing what is soon to come for his disciples, right then in the first century. And, a, and of the faithful original apostles, 10 out of 11 did die violent martyrs' deaths. Tradition tells us that the apostle John was boiled in oil in an attempt to kill him, but he survived. And when you look at church history, believers on Jesus Christ have been attacked and maligned regularly over the centuries. Some dying for the horrible crime of simply owning a Bible in their own language. Yes, Yes, we are living in turbulent times. And yes, the return of Jesus Christ is imminent. So you must keep looking up to the skies and you must continue to reach out to others that do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior and share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is interesting reading about some of the histories of cults 
that have been positive that Jesus Christ was going to return a specific year and what they taught their followers to do. And at one time, one cult taught, told their misguided followers to not bother to get married because Jesus Christ was returning within 10 years. And there were very many upset people when Jesus Christ did not return them. <coughs> and the sad part is that same cult then told its followers to hold off again, and people did. Other cults would gather its relatively few members together, and they would await the return in their stronghold. And sadly, some of those cults then initiated <coughs> suicidal measures, believing that this would enable them to be with Jesus Christ even faster. But what you do not see these cults do while they are in that time frame of believing that Jesus Christ <coughs> was coming at a specific time. What did you not see them do? They did not go forth and tell others about the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> they would announce that he was coming, but they did not preach the gospel message of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for their sins. And then Jesus Christ being buried in the sepulcher, and on the third day, Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. Sadly, these cults focused on themselves and did not want to share the good news that they supposedly had. And you saw that even as recently in the last 20, 30 years, when, when uh, we were sure the world was going to end was because it was the year 2000. And you look at like with Jim Jones and the Branch Davidians and all these other groups. And the sad thing is, is what you see in common with them is that they would reach a point where they wouldn't allow anybody else in. Jesus Christ doesn't teach that. We're, we're I'm trying to think how to put it exactly. Jesus Christ is not. In one sense, he is not exclusive, but he is inclusive. But in another sense, he is exclusive. You only come to Christ to believe on him. It doesn't mean that everybody is going to get saved. If they don't have their faith on Jesus Christ, they're still condemned. And, and But in the meantime... We're told to still go and command, and told to tell all the world. Jesus Christ didn't say, go to the uttermost parts of the earth until I'm almost here, and then stop. He said, go. He didn't say when to stop. And, and that's what we have to keep in mind, is that he never said to stop. And even though you may be in a time of turmoil and trouble, that does not mean you get a pass on telling people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to look past yourself and your fears of man and tell people about Jesus Christ. Why? Because as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are commanded to tell all the world. Why? Because you love Jesus Christ and, and, and you love your neighbor. And that must drive you to tell others about Jesus Christ and his gospel message. You must get past your fears and tell people because the days are getting short. Every person on this earth has a limited amount of days. How are you using yours? Are you allowing your fear of man to stop you from giving out the gospel? Look again at verse 26. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that it shall not be known. It is truly interesting, because if you truly fear the Lord God of heaven as a disciple of Jesus Christ, then it is a different fear than the fear of the Lord that the lost have of the Lord. 
As a follower of Jesus Christ, your fear of the Lord is a healthy respect for God. It is not a terrified fear of the Lord. You fear the Lord and you respect the Lord because you understand what he has done for you by saving your soul and you understand what awaits those that do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Those that are not born again on the surface, they show disdain and disrespect for Jesus Christ. But deep down, they know what awaits them if they do not believe on him. They may try very hard to hide their fear of the Lord, but it is still there deep inside, unless their conscience is seared. And I think in a lot of ways that's why you see <clears throat> skulls so much. Because people fear dying. And a skull is typically, it's just a ladybug. It's, a skull is typically a symbol of death. It's a typically a symbol of death. And people think, they, in a sense, that they can control that fear of death in a way, and they'll have it tattooed onto their arm, on their leg, on their forehead. You know, they'll have shirts that have skulls all over them. Um, you know, my wife was showing me the other day, they're selling these Hello Kitty toys. And, and the face of the Hello Kitty toy is a skull. And, and to add to it, because it's also apparently a Hello Kitty that can tell the future somehow, it also has a, a, a essentially a third eye in the middle of its forehead. It looks like a jewel, but that's what they're depicting is a third eye. This is what's being passed off as entertainment and fun and get it for Christmas before it sells out. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 26, Jesus Christ is telling his disciples to not fear man, nor to be afraid of what man can do to you. In this world, there are many, many things that happen behind closed doors. There are clandestine meetings and there are schemes and there are machinations. There are always, there are always those people that believe themselves to be the elite. The ones that believe that they are the only ones that know what is truly best for this world. And this world has always had those men and women lust for power and control. You know what? You need not fear them. For the Lord God of heaven has it all well in hand. In Genesis chapter 11, for example, after the flood, the Lord told Noah and his descendants to go forth and to replenish the earth and spread out across the world. But what happened? Instead, they stayed close together. And some began to believe again that they could control all. Genesis 11:4 says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. These men believed they could somehow overthrow God, and they could be in control of over all the earth. They underestimated the Lord, and he took care of their attempt at rebellion by confounding their language, so nobody could understand what others were saying. God knew what they were planning, and he stopped them with ease. There is nothing that will remain covered. There is nothing that will not be revealed one day. There is nothing that will remain hidden. The Lord God will bring the th things done in darkness to light. And people's sins will be exposed. What people do when they think nobody watching is watching will be shown. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, you do not have to fear what man will do. You do not have to be obsessed with what evil men and evil women are doing across this world. It is really no different than what evil men and women have been doing for centuries. The methods may change, 
but the motives remain the same over the years. They will be exposed, and they will be judged by the Almighty God one day. He will bring their schemes to light, and he laughs at the plans that men have against him. Verse 27. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Jesus Christ came to his chosen people, the Jewish people. He spoke to them in parables. He spoke to them with sayings that were in darkness to them. They did not understand what Jesus Christ was, uh, was saying. And in part, because they continued to reject Jesus Christ. And even at this time, his disciples did not understand everything that he was telling them. They were having trouble grasping that he came here to die on the cross in order to be that final sacrifice needed to pay for their sins. The disciples believed that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, but they also thought that he was coming to set up his kingdom now, not later. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, did the the apostles understand what he had been telling them all along, and now they were able to speak in the light. They were to go forth and tell the gospel of Jesus Christ to the uttermost parts of the world. And what they heard Jesus Christ tell them, they were to now preach from the rooftops. The word of God was to be spread across the world, and we are to continue to do that today. It is truly the good news that people must hear today and pray that they will believe it. God wants your obedience. He wants you to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but, you are, but, mm, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So if I were to sum up this verse, fear God. Fear God. Fear God and not fear man. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, Solomon wrote, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And you think about all that Solomon put himself through, trying every form of pleasure, finding trying every form of entertainment, trying this, that, and the other thing, building things, and marrying 700 wives and 300 concubines, and he found no joy in any of it. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He finally, in his later years, realizes, sums it up like that, fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. Man can do all sorts of things to you physically and mentally and emotionally, but your time here on earth passes in a blink of an eye, and then you have all of eternity. I said earlier, I can't believe that it's already almost the middle of the month. You know, think about how fast these first 12 days have gone, to me anyways. And, and I think about, you know, how fast these 59 years have gone. Now the first 20, they went slow. The rest went very fast. We seem to go even faster, like going downhill on a roller coaster. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you have an eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven to look forward to, an eternity of rest and joy with your Savior. Sadly, for the person that has rejected Jesus Christ, they too have an eternity ahead of them, an eternity spent having body and soul in hell, everlastingly destroyed. You know, 
and so all of this that's going on, it's going to be gone in a blink of an eye. And then we'll be in heaven. That's why our hope is there with Jesus Christ and not here on earth. It's got to be with him, not here on earth. And you know, with the heathen, they're going to rage against God. And the people will imagine a vain thing against the Lord. And the kings of this earth and the rulers will take counsel together. And they will try to plan against the Lord, thinking that they can escape him and rule themselves and others. And the Lord, the Lord laughs at such scheming. He has them in derision. One day, the king, Jesus Christ, will reign here on earth. And those that continue to reject him, they can call on all the rocks and trees and caverns to hide them. It won't work. They will be separated from his people, and they will spend an eternity in the lake of fire. It doesn't have to be that way, though. But sadly, they turn from Jesus Christ, and there will be consequences. But I urge you, in the meantime, for yourself, don't get caught up in the affairs of this world. They will only serve to distract you and distress you. Your eternal hope is found in Jesus Christ and not in this world. Think about it. He has gone ahead to prepare a place for you, and nobody can take that away from you. I have a permanent reservation awaiting me in heaven. You know, he, he didn't go ahead, prepare a place for me, and then put on a piece of, on a, put a whiteboard up and say, right for now, Scott agrees, but he's ready to erase it. Think about it, what it says in, in Jeremiah, you know, my name is graven in his hands. It's there. When you think about engraving, it stays. Now, I, I like, I, you go to like these old cemeteries and you look at some of the oldest gravestones and you can still see sometimes the, 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 the names of the people chipped into the, the stone. Despite all that has happened over the years, rain and snow and everything else hasn't fully eroded them away. But at one point, they were much deeper cuts, but they've worn away because of time. I'm in my Lord's hands. My name is graven there. It's not going to go away. It's not going to change. Chapter 10, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore... Ye are of more value than many sparrows. What? What are you afraid of? What do you have anxiety, anxiety about? Why do you have fears and doubts? Think about the sparrow. The sparrow is a small bird, and there are always a lot of sparrows. They are a very common bird. We see them all the time in our backyard, feeding in the seed that has fallen to the ground from our bird feeders. And they're all over the place. And we can never tell one sparrow from another. They all seem to look the same to me. You know, my, my, I think my wife could pick them out better than I can. And, and, but they all seem to be the same. They're all very common. And it says here how two, two sparrows are sold for a mere farthing, which tells us that a sparrow is not an expensive bird by any means. And yet, if one sparrow falls down and dies, the Lord knows that the sparrow died. It did not pass from his knowledge about that sparrow. So he knows each and every sparrow. Therefore, if God knows each and every sparrow, consider how much more that he knows you and cares for you. 
The Lord knows every hair that is on your head, including the ones that came off when you brushed your hair this morning. And best of all, you are of much greater value to the Lord than many sparrows. And if the Lord knows where every sparrow is, then he assuredly knows where you are. That should bring you comfort, and that should bring you hope. He knows where you are. And growing up, you know, we, we actually went outside and played at night. I still somehow fit in a lot of TV watching, but we were outside in the summer. We were outside. We would play into the night, into the darkness. My mother knew roughly where we would be, but she didn't know exactly, and so she'd have to yell, you know, yell my name, and, and hopefully I would hear her and, and call back. If I didn't, then she'd yell louder. You didn't want to have three yells, you know, but she, didn't, she knew roughly where I would be. God knows exactly where I am. God knows exactly. You know, I realize, you know, you have these, the phones with the GPS and everything, and you can have apps that can track a person and everything else, and you can put things on your phone to tell you if your phone has been lost, you can, you know, tell you right where it is and everything. God doesn't need any of that. He knows exactly where each of us are at any given moment, at every given time. And you are of greater value than many sparrows. The Lord knitted you in your mother's womb. He knows you. He knows you. Then why do you fret? God cares for the sparrows, and he cares even more for you. Knowing that, please daily remind yourself of that. Take no thought for tomorrow, for God already has that well under control. He has his eye on the sparrow. You know, he watches me. Proverbs 12, 25 says, Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. When you think about it, when your heart is heavy, what does it do? It makes you stoop. It is like taking a bowling ball and wearing it around your neck. The weight of the ball will make you stoop forward. Your shoulders will hunch and droop under the weight. And that is what depression and sadness will do to you. It keeps your head low, so you cannot look up toward God. When you dwell on your pains and your fears and your sorrows, your heart becomes heavy and it will stoop. If not physically, you will stoop emotionally. And that stooping will stunt you spiritually. Your focus is removed from the Lord and your focus turns inward. And then you shut down and shut out other people, neither of which is healthy. You are of more value than many sparrows to the Lord. Always remember that. Even if you foolishly think that nobody else values you, know this, that Jesus Christ values you so much that he died for you. And when that heaviness overtakes you, a good word will make your heart glad. That heaviness has, in part, happened because you have taken your eyes off of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your fear of the future, your fear of man takes over when the heaviness takes over your heart. And to restore your hope, you must stop dwelling on yourself and look to Jesus Christ. And that's what, you know, that's what happens. I heard an alarming statistic the other day that the second leading cause of death for those that are aged, aged 10 to 14, 10 to 14, the second leading cause of death is suicide. 10 to 14 years old. I never thought about stuff like that when I was 10 to 14. I thought about football, baseball, stuff like that. I didn't. How awful. It shouldn't be that way. 
and suicide is a rising form of death for more and more people. And when you have things like the MAID program in Canada, medically, medically assisted something, something, something in death. It's a national government program and they keep expanding it so that at first it was for those that were terminally ill, but they're expanding it and grow, trying to make it grow to cover anybody that might be mentally ill and they don't see any other, they're not gonna be able to make a decision to be able to say, I want to die and have it be an informed decision. And it's happening in, in Europe as well. We're becoming such a culture of death. I don't want to be a burden anymore. Your family wouldn't call you that. But so many are taking their lives and attempting to take their lives. We all have someone that loves us. It may not seem like it sometimes, but we all have someone that loves us. And at the very best, we have Jesus Christ that loves us because he gave his life for us. And even if the person doesn't know Christ as their savior, they can, they can. But we don't know where people are in their stages of life. That's why we gotta get the gospel to them. Let them know that there is that hope. Let them know. I, I realize it kind of sounds funny. You're of more value than many sparrows to the Lord you are because God considers that one little sparrow so valuable you must be of infinitely greater value to him and it's not a case of oh he's got your picture on his refrigerator in heaven type of thing it's because he does care it's a greater love than I got your picture on my refrigerator thing it's a greater love because he's died for them he died for us Psalm 56, verse, 50, verse 3 says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Trust in the Lord. He will help you. But it does not mean that Jesus Christ provides an instant cure. Removing the heaviness of your heart takes time, and it can take work on your part. We talked about this some last week as well. You must start, though, by looking to Jesus Christ for help. Trust in him. Remember the promises that he has made to you in his word, because Jesus Christ will never forsake you. It's not an instant cure. And I can't just say, you know, well, now that you're saved, you should be happy all the time. Don't plaster a smile on your face if you're sad on the inside. But don't stay sad. Again, don't be fake about it, but pray. Reach out to God. What's going on, Lord? Help me. Get in the word. Look to him. Isaiah 26, verse 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. The more you keep your mind stayed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you attain that perfect peace that he offers. God is your source for strength and wisdom. Trust him and ask him daily for that strength and wisdom. You know, but as Ken and I were talking a little bit earlier, that pocket computer work so hard to keep you distracted. And what was it? There was an article, actually, I think it's an article in the, the Friday Church News that I printed out today. The, the, one of the original guys on Facebook, that made Facebook, built Facebook, whatever it's called, uh, admits, yeah, it was designed to be addicting and distracting. We need to get past those distractions Keep the focus towards Christ. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear, not, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee for, with the right hand of my righteousness. 
That is part of that daily task for each believer. Do not get entangled in the affairs of this life, but keep your focus on Jesus Christ and on him alone. And you think about what it's saying there in verse 40, in chapter 41 there, I will strengthen thee. He is that source of strength that we need. You know, so many people, they, 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 they show up in that nutritional supplement aisle at the store and they want to buy those big jugs of powders, protein powders, and, and, and this stuff and then that stuff and thinking, oh, this is what I need. It'll give me muscle tone and, and, and it'll make me more healthy and, and all these things. It'll help you physically. It's not going to help you spiritually. And that's the strengthening that I need more so than the physical. I need the spiritual strengthening. But we have to keep our focus towards Christ. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your, th re <coughs> let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And that's the message we have to get out to people. Jesus Christ died for their sins. That's their biggest need, is they need those sins taken care of. The shame of those sins, the pain of those sins, what those sins have done to yourself and to others, they can be forgiven by Jesus Christ. Forgiven and forgotten. You don't have to bear that burden any longer. It's what they need to be told. And, and, and the idea there with verse, chapter, verse 6 of Philippians 4, be careful for nothing. Don't worry. Don't fret. But in every, not something, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. We go to God with that prayer. So daily we need to fear the Lord. Do not fear what others will think of you. Do not fear what others are saying. Because if you are walking correctly with the Lord, then it does not matter what others are saying or thinking. Keep in mind the fate of those that have rejected Jesus Christ and pray for them. Prayer, prayer is what you and I can do as we approach that throne of grace, seeking God's mercy and finding his grace. You think about, I, I read this, um, somebody wrote about this, and, and approaching that throne of grace and mercy. And, and the, the person, he gives an illustration of how a boat can be, you know, attached to the shore with a long rope. And the men would get in the boat and they would go out. They didn't row out or anything. They would float out and at the end of the rope, and I assume they would do some fishing or whatever from there. And once that boat was far out into the sea, the crew would begin then began to pull on the line. In other words, those men that were in the boat would then begin to pull on that rope to bring them closer to shore. And as that distance closed between the land and the boat, I can see how those sailors would be tempted to think, I'm not pulling the boat closer to shore, I'm pulling the land closer to me. You know, it's, it's that visual thing. You know, and, and like you notice that sometimes if you're driving on a busy highway and, and it's multiple lanes of traffic and, and you feel like you're not getting any progress because everybody's passing you. That's me. Um, they could be very tempted to think that they're actually pulling the land closer to themselves, but obviously, of course, the land isn't moved any. It was the boat that moved as it was being steadily pulled toward the island. And it's the same way as we attach, we attach our desires to God's throne with prayer. We and our desires are that boat, and prayer is the rope. And as we pull on the rope, which is to say, you know, we start to pray, we're not going to move God's throne closer to ourselves. Instead, 
we are drawn closer to the throne. We do not make God be more like us. Instead, we become more like God. Our desires do not overwhelm what God has said, and, and our will will not supersede Him, but instead we're going to be conformed more and more to Jesus Christ and to God. Our desires will become submitted to His, and our will will yield to Him. And what ends up happening, the closer we get to God, the more we've been reconciled to God. We're in harmony with God. And then we can delight ourselves in His answer to our prayers, no matter what that answer may have been. Even if it was not the answer we had been hoping it would be, we'll be content in it. We'll be content in it. So as we draw closer to God through prayer, as we come closer in conformity to God through earnest prayer, we will find ourselves with plenty or want, joy or sorrow, peace or turmoil. The result is, my desires line up with his desires. My joy is no longer based on me or anybody else around me, but my joy is based on Jesus Christ. When you think about that with harmony, you know, I mean, we have you know, a professional group that sings, especially like a cappella. And, and they sing in harmony, and, and each part, each one has a, a, you know, there's a bass, a tenor, a soprano, and a alto, you know, and, and they all sing together. And, and so you'll notice sometimes they'll each be singing their own line. It'll be the bass player, the soprano, and so forth. But then also, every so often, they'll sing where they're all singing on the same level. That's that harmony that we would have with God. We won't be, what's the word, atonal. We won't be out of sync with God the more we are spending the time with Him. And what will happen? We will draw near to His throne. We will have gone nearer to Him. We will have gone boldly to that throne of grace that, that, that's written about in the book of Hebrews at the end of chapter 4. We will have gone boldly to that throne of grace be content. We'll be at peace with God, no longer fighting with Him. And that's what He calls us to do, is to be content with Him. And when we're content with Him, why would we worry? Why would we fret? And if we're content with Him, how much the better and easier it is to tell others then about Jesus Christ. Called to do that, but we're also called to walk closely with Him. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, again I thank you for this time with Your Word, and I thank you, Lord, because Your Word is a comfort. It is the comfort that we need. Your word is what we need each and every day. It is our daily bread. And Lord, I thank you that you want us to pray to you and how that draws us ever closer to you because we're taking that time and spending it with you and you alone. Lord, I thank you again because you have been so very good to us. And we have such a wonderful message to share with that, with the world. And I pray that daily we would seek your strength and you would give it to us. And I pray we would daily seek your wisdom and you will be bountiful with it. And Lord, I pray that we would then use that strength and wisdom for your glory and not our own. Lord, I pray 
pray for those that we meet this week for those that don't know Christ as their Savior I pray and pray you would work on those hearts pray God that you would help us to be those witnesses that you need us to be want us to be that we would be your ministers that you want us to be as we reach out to this hurting world and these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.